Chow. She's a contemporary composer who is uh, one year older than me, I think. <laughs> and um, sh so she's very active as a composer. She's a violinist. She's a vocalist. And she is a Pulitzer Prize uh, winner. Um, so her piece is very, for me, is very now. Yeah, she has a um, very good like storytelling way in her composition. And so recently, a couple months ago, we actually attended a, a concert um, featuring her with the Permusica um, Chamber Orchestra in Ohio. So she was performing two of her pieces, and then and then she was um, the the vocalist for one of the pieces, and and then she played in the the violin section for Brahms um, for the symphony. So it's it's really really cool to. Um, being able to see her and um, and being able to play her piece um, that makes us feel like we're really connected with her uh, that way. So um, the title of the piece is Limestone and Felt. So um, from our performance, did you hear any sounds that resemble any of those textures? Yeah. Anyone wants to kind of like describe what you heard? Yes. Well, I think um, just sort of. I don't know the name of the technique, but when you were just plucking yeah. the strings, it kind of made me think of a cave. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's yeah, cool. yeah. So um, the pizzicato, that's the, the, the official name, term of the um, technique, essentially is plucking the strings. And it is used to describe this um, limestone um, texture. And then we have normal, regular way to, to pluck. And then we also have this kind of way to pluck. And then if this is called the Bartok uh, pizzicato. Bartok is a Hungarian composer, and um, he uses uh, he used a lot of this kind of pizzicato in his composition. So um, people dedicate this um, texture of sound to to him. And what about felt? Any of the sound quality that you heard that resemble felt? So like when we play with a bow, right? Yeah, so when, when we have chords, like that kind of the contrast sound between the, the oracle, mean, meaning playing with the bow, and the pizzicato. So, um, so that's essentially what this piece was. Yeah, so you know, um, we are, as musicians, we relate our experience to the title and then to the, the, how the piece is put together. And then she um, used a very clever way to incorporate rhythm and incorporate chords to make it sound really effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the next thing that we're going to play for you is not modern. It's the only thing on our program that was not written in the last 100 years. Uh, but it's by a pretty famous composer named Beethoven. <laughs> and Beethoven is, uh, I mean, he's beloved. He's, they, they, they put him up on a pedestal, you know, and, and sometimes when we think about his music and we think about uh, just listening to it, it could be intimidating. I mean, even for me. And people assume that since I'm a professional musician that I must be hearing this music on a higher level than the average person. And I really think that that's not true. Partly I'm unintelligent, but the other reason is there's not only so many different ways to listen to a piece, but it's usually very simple things that I'm listening for. And this piece is gonna show them in, in, I think, in a really nice, clear way. So I wanna try and guide your ear. The first thing I listen for is, is something happening in the foreground or in the background? You might know the words melody and accompaniment, right? And it's just very cut and dry. There's places where it's singing, is going to have the melody, and I'm gonna have the accompaniment. And then guess what he does? we switch, right? And then I play the same melody and she does the accompaniment. It's a very simple thing and that can guide your ear in any piece you listen to. I also like to think, are we playing something together? Are our voices trying to collaborate or are our voices arguing? And you're gonna hear both in this piece. Another thing you could listen for, does the music sound, uh, I guess you could think about peanut butter, does it sound chunky or does it sound smooth? There's a lot of things that uh, Beethoven does in this piece where everything is very smooth and soft and pretty, and some of it is bouncy and crunchy and disjointed, and, and the, the give and take between those things is a lot of fun. But 
for the most part, and the most important thing is just when you listen to a piece, just how does it make you feel? And there's no wrong answers. You can enjoy any piece of classical music and just by asking yourself, do I like this? Do I feel itchy when I hear this? Do I feel calm, you know? There's a whole wide range of human emotions to hear a piece like this. So we're going to play this duet for viola and cello, the only one written by Beethoven. It's called the Eyeglass Duet. He wrote it when he was a young man. No one knows exactly why it's called that. They think the cellist that he played it with uh, wore glasses and he was teasing the cellist who, for his bad eyesight. So it's called the Eyeglass Duet. Oh, and Beethoven played the viola, I think, for yeah. this. So. Mm -hmm. Beethoven was yeah. the viola. Thank you. 
And successful pop songs have twists, right? Like, do you, like sometimes you hear chords, um, twists, uh, you know, beats, you know, drop at the time where you wasn't expecting. And then to me, um, classical composers, they sort of use the technique they have or they invent some to create this kind of like journey in, in the sound world. And if we, we don't have to like study a lot to understand it, but like if we can try to just sort of see where this music takes us and then we can feel it in the way if the composition was effective. So, you know, I want to encourage everybody to just sort of, you know, trying to relay like different kinds of art forms, how to appreciate them, and then it sort of add another layer to your, you know, um, entertainment for your daily lives. It's, I just thought it's like really cool, yeah. Um, the next piece we'll play is by Rebecca Clark. She was uh, probably one of the most prominent violists uh, ever existed in classical music, and then she was, so she had a career playing in a professional orchestra. She was a soloist, she was a chamber musician, and she was also a very successful uh, composer. And this piece she wrote for viola and cello, um, two pieces for viola and cello, and the first one is called Lullaby, and then the second one is called Grotesque. Yeah, and I think the music will speak for itself, so we're just gonna play it for you. One thing I wanted yeah. to show, in the Lullaby movement, we put something on our bridge. Has anybody seen these on a string instrument before? guesses what this is called? This is called a mute, that's right. And so you'll notice it's gonna change our sound a little bit. It's gonna make it softer, more, uh, kind of a smoky kind of sound. It's uh, good for the uh, I tried to pick it up on uh, your first piece because I noticed both of you were turning it on and off throughout and I, and I it was so subtle, I, I had a lot of trouble. With the mute? Yeah. Uh, our first piece didn't have any Maybe because we were reaching, so okay. it looks like we were Maybe. doing it. Yeah, but yeah. That, we don't have that in the first piece, but we're definitely doing it in this piece. Yeah, the sound quality is very different. Yeah, so it rings less, and then there's a little um, muffled sound. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if any of you were curious about what we were doing with our feet, it's not that we're dancing. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a page turner. It's connected to my iPad. Um, it looks like this. <laughs> Um, technology, yes. Um, <laughs> um, some of pieces were able to, we we're able to perform from paper copy, but some pieces that we couldn't, and yeah. <laughs> we're forced to adapt to the new technology, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Playful to me, but <laughs> maybe we should make it more grotesque. Yeah, maybe that's on us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's jarring after the lullaby. That's one thing I always like about that piece. Yeah. Is those movements could not be more different. <laughs> um, forgot to introduce ourselves. Um, um, my name is Zi Ying Wen. Um, I teach viola and string education at University of Kentucky. And I'm also the director of the UK String Project. And we have some students here today. Yay! <laughs> and um, I, um, well, before I came to UK, I was living in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I was directing a string project for the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra for about three years and playing in the orchestra. Uh, in addition to all of that, I'm also um, the founding member of the Harp Trio. Harp Trio consists of uh, viola, lute, and harp. And I'm from Taiwan. Um, so our trio is called the Formosa Trio. Um, so because my two other members are also from Taiwan, we met in school. And then we've j been just been um, performing a lot. Um, at one point we were touring in the States at some universities and then we were playing in Shanghai and then we gave several concerts in Taiwan and uh, we love connecting with composers so we commissioned several pieces and then present them in conferences and uh, my goal is to bring my trio to Lexington at some point uh, next year hopefully and so we can present our music for you. Um, we have an album called First Impression it's on Spotify if you're interested you can check it out. And and I'm Ethan, <laughs> uh, and I also teach with the UK String Project and also through the C Central Kentucky Youth Orchestra's Music Works program, which provides uh, free uh, music education to, uh, to kids. The instruments are all there, and so if you have anybody who's, you know, we've always wanted to pick up a violin, viola, or cello, but the expense was, uh, was a factor, and I, I recommend that as an option. And I was also, I was playing with the Arkansas Symphony before we moved to Lexington, and uh, so now I, I play around and try and do as much of this kind of thing as possible. It's such a pleasure to get to play for you guys. Yeah. And to, you know, play husband and wife. Like, that's as fun as it gets, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. So, did we mention we're married? Does no, anyone know? Okay, yeah, we're married. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. We have two boys, um, yeah. two and five. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and also we have a dog. <laughs> That's the most important part. Yeah, we so. rehearse after our kids um, go to bed. That's the only time, so like from 9 p.m. to like 10, 11. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> That's the only time we can practice or rehearse, so. <laughs> so yes. we've got one more piece to play for you guys. Um, like I mentioned, uh, everything except for the Beethoven was written in the last 100 years, and people would call that modern music. And usually that uh, title uh, scares people off. Um, you guys have probably heard some example of modern music that uh, did not sit well with you. And I'm the same. And I like some of the really weird stuff that turns off a lot of audiences. I'm into it. But the most important thing is there is something for everybody. And I hope these pieces that we were playing, I mean, especially even in the last 20 years, the Caroline Shaw we started with was written in 2012. Uh, this next piece we're going to play for you, 2014. Um, so there's almost kind of a, a, a new uh, surge of music being composed these days that, yeah, is as modern as it gets, but is a lot more interesting to listen to, frankly, and more accessible for more ages. 
Um, so yeah, I hope you get, if you get anything out of this is that please go find something written recently. Don't be afraid of modern music. It's really cool stuff. Um, so the composer, his name is Paul Wianko. Um, he's also same as our generation. Um, he wrote this piece for him and then his uh, partner, who's who plays the viola, obviously. Um, and this piece is called American Haiku. It comes in three movements. So the first movement title is Far Away. And then the second movement title is In Transit. And the last movement is called Home. Um, do you want to talk about the element? So yeah. yeah, if to listen to in this piece, there's a lot of like fiddle, Appalachian fiddle influence. And so that's definitely in there, but not in a straightforward way. Uh, Ziying talked about music being fun for the twists that it has. And this thing is Appalachian fiddle music twisted all around itself. And there's a lot of energy, and there's a lot of um, kind of like wistful longing things in this too, and I think that's some of the fun contrast. When is there this fiddle drive? And then when is there this poetic, um, almost homesickness, I think. I mean, the first movement is called Far Away, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's built in. So I hope you enjoy it. This is American Haiku by Paul Nyango, and I'm going to tune just for a second. <laughs>
Thank mm-hmm. you.